a, a good story isn't just about what happens. It's really more about who it happens to. Mm -hmm. And so the creating of uh, characters who are rich, complex, uh, believably human, um, I think is at the heart of all great stories. And Welcome to our latest Book Reporter Talks to interview where our guest today is William Kent Kruger. We're talking about a different project for him, a novella that is only available in audio format. We're going to be talking a lot about novella, which is different for him, and audio just being available in this format. Before we uh, have him uh, come on and speak with us, I'm going to share two terrific blurbs about The Levy. Kim Michelle Richardson, author of the book Woman of Troublesome Creep, calls it a masterwork riveting and unputdownable with richly drawn characters set against the unforgiving backdrop of a raging river and the wrath of nature. And then Mary Alice Monroe, the author of the Beach House series says, William Crank Kruger is our generation's Steinbeck. He's in touch with the American soul and writes with understanding and compassion for the human condition. I could not agree with them more. And with those two quotes in mind, welcome Kent. It's always a pleasure to be with you, Carol. Thanks so much. So let's see, this is just something a little bit different for you to be doing. Let's talk about the levy just as a story unto itself. Let's talk about what the levy is about, and then we'll get into the other particulars. Sure. The levy takes place in the spring of 1927 uh, during the worst flood in our nation's history. Um, at that time, uh, that spring, the Mississippi River at Memphis was 80 miles wide. Um, the devastation was just uh, enormous, um, unimaginable. And uh, my story concerns uh, four men, three of them are convicts, who've been conscripted to risk their lives on the river in order to try to rescue a family they believe uh, to be trapped by the flood. And this is a piece that you started a while back. It's something that you had in the drawer. Like you, I'd yeah. love to be in Ken's drawer, just looking around what's in the drawers over there. What, <laughs> what drew you to pull this one out and start working on it? What said, I, I the story is by grabbing me again. Yeah, let me, uh, let me give you the, the, sort of the history of it. I first, uh, I gave my first shot at writing the levy uh, back in my twenties. I had just read Faulkner's The Old Man. Uh, and the old man is is also about that enormous flood uh, on the Mississippi River. Uh, it's about a guy, a convict, who is conscripted to try to save uh, a pregnant woman trapped by the flood. And uh, I really loved the conceit of the story. And I thought, well, let's see if I can give, I, maybe I can do what Faulkner did. <laughs> uh, so I, uh, I gave a shot to writing a short story, The Levy, and uh, wasn't happy with it. So I put it away. Uh, 20 years later, when I was taking a creative writing class at the University of Minnesota, I pulled that uh, story out again, dusted it off, got the dust bunnies away from it, and gave it another shot. The class and the instructor really liked the story, but their basic comment was, there's a much richer tale to be told here. So I put it back in the drawer. Then the pandemic came along, and uh, I had this, this very rich, productive period during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I wrote a couple of uh, uh, full novel manuscripts. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote a couple of other novellas, and, and then I didn't have any more ideas left. So I <laughs> went back to that drawer, pulled out the levy, and uh, took a look at it. And, and I thought, I think I know what to do with this now. So I completely rewrote the story into uh, the way it stands right now. I was really, really pleased with it. Um, so that's kind of the history of the levy. <laughs> aren't but you, you know it's a novella. It's a novella. You, you saved it. Aren't you glad you saved it? You know? A oh, absolutely. People... You know, every writer knows you never throw anything away. <laughs> but, it, know, but it is a novella. It is a novella. And a novella is a, kind of a difficult uh, length piece to, to get published anywhere these days because the magazines that in the old days might have published a novella length piece just aren't around anymore and you can't really put a novella up on the shelf with full-sized books and expect it to do very well so I wasn't sure that anything would ever happen with the novella until my publisher Simon and Schuster said we've got an idea. It's a really terrific idea too because the book the book the story lends itself to audio so well. And we're going to get into that in, in a little bit because I think that when you hear the story, this is the kind of story you can sit back 
And sometimes I think that people are looking to not look to listen to something that's book length. If somebody has not tried listening before, this is the one to jump in and try with because it's not going to consume days of driving and listening or walking around and gardening. It's going to be a shorter story for you to be able to enjoy in an audio format. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. It's a perfect length for, you know, heading out into the garden and uh, getting your garden ready for spring or whatever you're doing. And then Minnesota, getting out there and shoveling the walk, listening to the levee would be just fine. <laughs> We're supposed to get snow tonight. It's sort of like waiting for Godot around here. It's like, <laughs> no, so every day they go, it's Central Park. We have not had this little snow in so many. I'm like, OK, I'd or be happy to send you some of ours. Let me tell you. <laughs> exactly. But I was saying to my husband, who, you know, I said, do you think we should get the tractor? around do you think this is carol it's gonna be three to six inches it will be gone in two days i am not making a production out of this <laughs> it's very funny very very funny so you know you wrote about the uh flood and 1927 where the mississippi flooded and it's a story that I confess i did not really know about when these little pieces of history come up when these little kernels is this something that you say oh that was a moment i sh could write about that moment and tell a story am i right on how you feel about it you know, I think there are lots of moments in our history that are forgotten uh, that would form the basis for fascinating stories, riveting, compelling stories. This simply happens to be one of them um, because I was not tremendously familiar with the details of the of the flood. I, um, you know, I did a lot of research, took a look at a lot of the uh, photos of the the devastation, which was just mind bending. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I live in I live on the Mississippi River here in St. Paul, and I have seen the Mississippi River flood in in enormous ways across the forty years I've been here. So I, I have a sense of what a river looks like, uh, and uh, and the presence of a river at at flood levels. So I was able to take the historical stuff, the pictures, uh, the reading that I'd done about the flood what my own um, experience with uh, big floods has been and use all of that to create the levy. You know, you know, you were first published when you were in your forties. And do you think that being published later gives you a different perspective on things because you see something one way when you're in twenties, one way when you're in your thirties. And I feel like the perspective to help you edit your work, because you've heard people talk about topics in their twenties, thirties, and forties and how they change their perspective or enrich the perspective. Do you think that that has had something on the emotion that goes into your writing as well? Mine, you know, so many of the writers that I know didn't publish their first work until there was gray in their hair. Mm. That said, I know a lot of really fine writers who began when they were a little more than babies and their work is just phenomenal. I think, you you know, you come to it whenever you're, you are meant to come to it. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that life experience, uh, the more you have life experience, um, the more wisdom uh, uh, insight you can bring to a piece of writing. Uh, I think the more depth you can give your characters because you've seen so many people across the course of your life and tried your, your best to understand them. So I, I, in the end, I guess I do agree with that. Yeah, I think that you get to know loss in different ways. You get to know, um, you get to also know, you may have been a parent. You may have seen what has happened with your own children by that point where you have dreams and then what happens and then how you have to change your expectations or whatever, just different things come into your life of, I have this, if you sit down when you're 20 and you write down on a piece of paper, this is going to be my life. And then you see how your life completely <laughs> changed from there. Yeah. You know, I think one of the things we learn across the course of our lives to get, get to, to live as long as I have is, uh, is the phenomenal resilience of the human spirit. Mm -hmm. And so you, uh, in mo much of my work tends to be about devastating things that, uh, that happen to people and how they recover from that, how they heal from the deep wounds that, that life delivers to us. And I'm not sure that you know that, you really have experienced <laughs> that when you're, when you're young. You know, it's with even few words, you can see something about your characters, the way you, I feel like I, I see them drawn on a piece of paper. I feel like I could draw them as, as I'm sitting there. Do you think that's one reason that your writing works so well in narration is because the characters are so fully formed that you can actually feel like you hear them speaking as you, I mean, they, they look like full form personalities to me. And I think that makes a big difference because sometimes in writing, you don't feel that you don't completely see the character on all sides. You know, for me, when I used to teach creative writing, uh, I would always tell my students, 
a, a good story isn't just about what happens. It's really more about who it happens to. Mm -hmm. And so the creating of uh, characters who are rich, complex, uh, believably human, um, I think is at the heart of all great stories. And so I work very hard at understanding my characters. Actually, very often the characters reveal themselves to me as I'm writing, as I'm mm -hmm. trying to understand them. And so in the levy, I had uh, an idea. I had a pretty good physical picture of the characters that uh, were going to populate the story. But as I began to put them in the story and have them play parts in the story, I began to understand them better, see them better. So so even the characters who um, attempt to, to create chaos in this particular story, by the end, I understood where they were coming from. And so I, even though I you know, didn't particularly like them necessarily, I could certainly understand why they would do the things that they would do. Um, so I think, I, I think that broad perspective of character, of human nature, um, has played an important part. But I gotta, I gotta be honest with you, you know, physically, um, writing for audio mm -hmm. was different for me than writing for a visual reader. And I was really fortunate at Simon and Schuster to have um, editors with the, uh, you know, the audiobook division who have had great experience in subtly changing a piece of writing so that it is better for the audio for to be listened to. And in terms of the introduction of the characters in this particular story and how to how to have them make an impact right away, physically, emotionally, um, they were so very helpful um, to me in that. And between that, between the writing and then the narration, which will bring different voice, he, one person bringing different voices to the characters, you don't feel like you're lost in the story. Do you know sometimes you're in a book and you're like, I'm lost. I don't know yeah. where I am. And I've heard a lot with people um, with two time frames on historical fiction. They don't know which one they're in. Yeah. And but here you felt like you were very much being told a tale. You were being, let me sit back and tell you a tale of what happened to these people. But as along the way, I love that the characters were revealing themselves. Like you see one thing and then you hear their backstory. And then you hear why they did this and why they did that. So we're becoming further engaged with them as the story goes on. But it's a listen. It's this listen kind of experience instead of just on the page. You know, from the very first time I tried to write the story, the opening line was always the same. And you talk, you just touched on it. You feel like you're being told a tale. Mm -hmm. And the opening line has always been, imagine with me the river. So I'm telling you, I'm a storyteller. This is the tale I'm going to tell you. Mm -hmm. Imagine with me the river. Um, and, you know, there's a moment, though, where readers see the physical wealth, the physical things really are inconsequential. It's all about who you are. And was that something you wanted to share? Because I really had that come across of you can have money, you can have silver, you can have a big house, you can have had this. But when the flood is coming and the waters may take everything that you've got, who are you and what do you have? Who do you really have with you? And I saw that very, very powerfully coming through in the writing. And if you look at the fates of the characters involved, their fates are very much dictated by the choices they make in terms of what's important in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that was uh, very consciously in there. Yeah. And the sacrifices sometimes, the choice that we make uh, to sacrifice uh, and, and why we do that. Yeah, you know, many well, one, one more thing I just want to add here, because I, I want to just pop back uh, mm -hmm. to, you know, the tale. You feel like you're being told a tale. I got to say, and maybe we're going to talk about this later in the interview, but I got to say, J.D. Jackson, mm -hmm. the reader, mm -hmm. does such a marvelous job of just mm -hmm. giving that sense uh, to the story. Yeah, I mean, his narration is so spot on. And do you know from the start, and the start that he was going to be the right narrator? Did they present you with a few people or what happened for that experience? Yeah, J.D. Jackson was right up there. Yep. And it's uh, yeah. really from the get go, I really loved the possibility of what when we when we listened to the uh, to the audition tape uh, really had um, great hopes for what he might bring to it. And he certainly did in spades. Yeah, Bookless said this about the narration. Uh, Jackson crafts consistent voices for many of the characters, softening his gravelly voice for women and making judicious use of accents. As the waters rise, the levee weakens and the tension increases. 
His uh, Jackson's soothing rhythmic narration is lulling. This allows for panicked dialogue to rise up and grip the listener like a cresting wave. His voice creates a cocoon around the listener like the levee itself, which seems protective, but could mask danger. Ultimately, yeah, I think they nailed it. <laughs> I think they completely, and it, it is what you feel like when you're there because you feel like you're on this levee with them, even though I had to look up a picture of a levee. I will be honest, Ken. I had to look up and say, where are these? Oh, this is up the bank of the what? I yeah, totally got it. Are you, you've never been along the Mississippi River, no. have you? Down south, yeah. <laughs> no, I haven't been along Mississippi. And I was like, okay, I think I need to go do this. You know, I think I'm missing something. And I remember the levees down in New Orleans. I remember all this, but to actually see, this is like, you know, Google levee, show me picture. You know? <laughs> Every once in a while, you have to do this. So what did you think when you first heard his narration? Did you feel like you were sitting back and being told your own story? You know, my, always my first reaction when I hear uh, somebody else read my work is, hmm, that ain't the way I would have read it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but as soon as I let go of that, it just kind of settled back. I was just bowled over with uh, the, the job that J.D. Jackson, Jackson did on this. Yeah. And and uh, the, uh, the folks at Booklist, I think, nailed it. I think mm -hmm. his... His ability to give unique voices um, is was particularly spectacular and catch the vernacular. I mean, this is uh, 1927. This is the Deep South. There are some very educated people, some uh, some people who have very little education speaking. And he was able to adjust his voice and, um, you know, give that individual sense to each each character. Yeah, until so you felt like you were hearing their voices, even though it was exactly. his, it really felt like everybody, Ida, everybody that was speaking, you say, oh, I understand what they're talking about. I understand who, who I wasn't lost. Like I said, once again, do you ever read your own work aloud? Like after you finish writing or is that something you do? Yeah, I, I read my work as as I'm writing. I'm sitting right there at my uh, keyboard and as I'm writing the dialogue, I'm going, no, oh, no, no, no. Drives my wife nuts. <laughs> um, and when I used, you know, until the pandemic made me write at home. I always wrote in coffee shops and people would come up and they'd say, you know, <laughs> we know you're not crazy. Because <laughs> I'm I'm speaking the dialogue as I'm writing. I'm listening to the prose as I'm, I'm hearing it. Because, you know, when you speak it out loud, you hear the clunk. Totally. You hear the natural rhythm or the unnatural rhythm and you need to know how to smooth it. Smooth it. So, yeah, I think that. And, you know, I have, I, I have to be honest with you, I've had some pushback from readers who say, I never, I don't do audio books. Mm -hmm. I wish this was in print because I don't do audio books. And what I try to point out, you know, that's fine. If, if that's the way you, mm -hmm. you uh, approach literature, that's fine. But what I point out to them is, you know, storytelling has traditionally, for millennia, been an oral tradition. Mm -hmm. You no, know, it's spoken. And so I think good stories are written in such a way that they just flow beautifully off the tongue. Mm -hmm. um, so that's as I as I do my own writing, as I was creating the levy, I was conscious of that. Yeah. I'm always conscious of that. But, you know, I think that people forget, like, we were read to as children. Like, I could recite Good Night Moon. Like, you know, what kind of read? Yeah, yeah. Recite Good Night Moon. Yeah, I don't know. And I think you could do it. And sometimes you see always... Wait a second, that was really the word? Like I made this word up like all oh, well. along? Like, and they did not notice. But you do that repetition of hearing a story and, and hearing a story builds and saying, I want to get back to it. And the same thing is, this is not something that you're just going to sit down and listen to. I mean, unless you have a couple of hours in like immediately. So you want to be able to be vested with the characters. You want to be able to feel like when you come back to them, you know who you are. You're not lost in the story. Yeah. And I think that's important with a good narration. I think that's what it really, that's what, that's what makes it work. Yeah. Good narration and uh, a well-written story accomplishes the same thing. <laughs> well-written story. You know, I do love this other line that you have that says we come into the world formless clay and our hearts are shaped by our experience. And was that something you thought about for a while or like when it made it there, did, was that one of those moments where you go, oh, like, did I hit a line that made you go, oh, boy, I'm good. Now, I like the line, but it has, uh, it, 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 I gave voice to a sensibility that I've had for a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, I've often told, uh, talked to audiences uh, about the, uh, the villains that I create, the mm -hmm. people in, in my stories who create chaos. And what I tell them is, is that, um, 
when I create someone who who does what seems like horrible things, nobody is born bad in my own belief system. Mm -hmm. Things happen across the course of their lives that shape them to do the things that they do. And what interests me then is what is it that has shaped someone to behave in this particular way, good or or bad? Mm -hmm. You know, you ask um, you ask a biologist, explain a, a, an organism to me. The biologist is going to say, look at the environment out of which that organism sprang. You ask a sociologist, explain human behavior to me. And they're going to tell you, look at the environment in which these people grew up. So I always try in my stories to look back when I created somebody who, who does horrible things and offer the reader sort of an idea about why this person behaves the way he or she does. Doesn't mean you have to like them. Mm -hmm. but I think you ought to understand them. Mm -hmm. You have to understand who they are and why they do. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of talk in this book about saving. Mosley wants to save his family. There's talk about what people have saved in the past. And I feel like that you make people think in your books, like sit there and say, well, wait a second, what is important? You walk away thinking about your own life as well. It's what matters when all is stripped down. Am I right? Because I see the characters as real people instead of just this like, you know, oh, so-and-so does this, that, the other thing. It's where they came from. And that's exactly what we were just talking about is people didn't just pop up. There was a background to them. Yeah, you know, always in my stories, the bottom line for most of my stories is hope. How as human beings do we heal from the great wounds that life delivers us? And if we've been, uh, if we have ourselves been wounded, how do we reach that place of forgiveness? Because I think that's the place we are meant uh, to be at the end of, uh, of this journey of our flesh. And so, yeah, it's always an important part of the story that I create. And, you know, it's feel like, look, we keep people see the prisoners and they'll say they're all the same. Like, oh, he's a prisoner. Oh, this is this. You show people as people. And then I love the backstories on how people came to be in prison, how they came to want to save the family. The backstory on this family of why did we go to this levy? So once again, it's, like the river is going this way and the river is coming up. But at the same time, our understanding of the people is coming up as well. And they're almost meeting at the same time of, is the water going to rush by the time we've really gotten to know these people? So we're going to kind of guess what they're going to do. Like, what do we think is going to happen? And then you flip it on, you know. Yeah, I'm glad you put that in there. I I kind of give you a few twists along the way there. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. exactly. You know, you rework the story. Were the changes that you made to more to the overall arc of the story or was a character or was it just everything we just like ripped it apart and said i got something here let me redo it yeah i pretty much gutted it and uh and went back at it so the the characters that were in it uh um mosley um dobbs uh the kid um the people behind the levy they were all pretty they all pretty much played the same sorts of parts I had originally imagined for them, but there is one character who foments a great deal of, um, of um, well, he's a problem, a problem, yeah. <laughs> troublemaker. Uh, I really rethought his character and the part he played enormously, and that what that part that change in the story helped me broaden the story in uh, both just in the richness of the storytelling but also in terms of the suspense of the tale itself. Mm -hmm. And it, it's like a quick thing. It's like this happened, then this happened. And all of a sudden the story went this way. It was yeah. like, we were heading in this direction and went whoosh, yeah. just like this. So here's a question. One of the things I've learned across now my my all my years as a storyteller that I didn't know when I was young and, and uh, you know, just starting out. So here's a question. What else is in the drawer? Like when you open that drawer, you go, hmm, what else have I got in here right now? Hmm, I could play with that one again. Is there a big collection? Not a big collection, but you know, Carol, I have a book coming out this fall. Mm -hmm. I put away in the drawer. And you know the story behind yes. my putting away yes. in the drawer of that particular story. So when I come back on uh, 
and we're yeah, we'll I do this again. Invite me we'll back to talk about the river we remember. We can we can, we can uh, tell everyone the story of how that ended up in the drawer and why I pulled it back out. Yeah, you know, and it's a, there are moments where something has to go away. It's like just not the moment the moment to be doing it or whatever. And then it's it's something you hold on to. I mean, I have this creative writing class I, that I took when I was in college. The same professor a couple of times. I really love the professor. So I took the same class a couple of times. And it was always this girl driving from Washington to New York was the start of the story. And I walked into his class for, I think, the film writing class. And he looked at me and goes, the girl is not going from Washington to New York. I need something else. <laughs> I just sat there. I was like, come on. It's so good. <laughs> but I literally played through it through three semesters of classes and I felt like it got better as time went on. But I have it in a little box over here and I am so tempted to pull it out and say, can I do something with that now based on reading people like William Kent Kruger all this time, all these years? I think I could make it better. <laughs> Well, you know, one of the things I have learned across all these years as a storyteller is, is that if you were trying to create a story and the whole time it feels like you're pushing against the river, it's probably not the right time for you mm -hmm. to take on that story. Mm -hmm. Maybe think about it some more. Bring it back in, let it gestate a little bit more, and then give it another try. Because if you're pushing the river, nothing is going to feel right to the reader. I mean, right. if you push it. Right. And, and I, I was thinking is it was the opener was always she was driving up and the windshield wipers were washing the rain the way she was washing away her tears. OK, it was like pretty it was pretty well bar here. It was really pretty well bar. I mean, <laughs> I can but understand. As I said, saying. as I said initially, never throw anything away. No, no, there's little box. And I found the boxes recently and I'm like, maybe I should relook at this. You know, <laughs> given my experience of working, doing book reporter for 27 years, maybe you learned something about writing, Carol, you know, but I wouldn't have five minutes to be doing that because I much more spend time, you know, speaking with people like you. So that's next. Is it September? When September. It comes out September 5th. September 5th. So we're and then I'll be going on a very long book tour that we're putting together right now. As Kent will definitely go on a tour. And luckily in the fall, he will not have to worry about snow. Or One never knows, Carol. Okay. <laughs> this is Minnesota. One never knows. One never knows. I mean, recently, it's just been, I couldn't get to here and I couldn't get back from here all both times because of snow. It's like, you know, really, really, really amusing. You know, I think that this has been such a nice experience for you to have, to try something different and try it with a different format of book for you or storytelling for you yep. at the same time in a different format. And I think that it's it's interesting to see how a story can come to life like this. Listen, I've listened to your audios before. I've listened to your audio books, but now to hear this person selling this novella that we've got to get in and out of quickly and to have done such a spectacular job on the read. I think that's, that's important. I think everything just came together in the way it was meant to come together. Right. It was the right time, you know, all of the stars aligned. Yeah. And it's, you know, you know, also you had time. I mean, think about it because we were all inside, we all did different things yeah. and it was big, a lot of people bake bread. There were a lot of people that weren't how to bake bread, <laughs> but you know, there were times where you, you went through the drawer and you went through to see what was going on. And I have one cousin who came up with this really great thought about what happened during the pandemic. You basically took everything out of your basket everything everything that you were doing in your life basically honed down to what you were doing at home and now what do you choose to put back in because she said you're not going to do it exactly the same way and it's not just because the pandemic changed you it's because that stop changed you and made you say how do i restart and it's interesting to see that something for you that was you know as, as tough a time as that brought something in a different format being published in a different way being published and it was like this exploration that may never have happened. You may have just sat there and said, I'm going to do the book a year. It's either going to be a cork book. It's going to be a standalone. And this was a chance to do a different expression. And I think her line really works of what went in the basket because might not have been thinking about audio, might not have been thinking about a novella. I really love that analogy. And I think it's perfect. Yeah. Because, you know, it's true. If I'd gone along the way I had been going along the way, my my life and my routine routine had been established. I probably wouldn't have pulled out the levy mm -hmm. and given another shot. So I'm really happy. You know, the <laughs> the pandemic was really a horrific thing. Uh, but what I try to look at is okay. What are the good things that came mm -hmm. from the pandemic? And I think that's one of the good things. We all did a lot of reassessment of our lives and our priorities. 
Mm -hmm. Family matters. These things matter. What matters? And pull those things to the forefront. And a lot of other stuff can just drift away. Yeah. Yeah. It was a great line. When she said that to me, I was like, Ooh, Marianne, that's a great line. I'm holding on to that one, you know? Yeah. And, and, and things change too, because like I used to go to yoga and they had a class at eight o'clock at night, another one at seven 30. They don't have those classes anymore. So I'm not going because those were the times that work for me, even though I'm working home now, I could go at six o'clock. That's not what I would want to do. And unless those are real, and it's really funny, these little tiny things, and I would go six days a week and now it's like zero, you know? (laughs) Has there, has there been something though that replaced the yoga? Um, a lot of working. A lot of, okay. You know what? We're doing a lot more of these interviews. We're doing a lot more programming, and I've been reading a lot for those. Um, I would say family time has replaced yeah. it. Yeah. Having dinner, not going into New York and having dinner at six o'clock has totally changed. And I also never realized, and it's like a storytelling kind of thing. My husband said, I always feared when you were coming home at night, I'm going to store a snowstorm or a rainstorm, and I don't need to worry about that anymore. And it was that kind of a thing where like, like your storytelling here, you never knew that mattered to somebody, but he said, you'd always stay till the end. I tell you to come home and the roads are going to be bad. And you do that. And he goes, that whole worry thing went away. And now we have like dinner at a normal time and we could eat together. And I'm sitting there going, wow, that was a lot of years of not doing that. It was a yeah. lot of years, you know? Yeah. And yeah. you sit there and say, oh, now I can. Yeah. Now you've discovered it's not too late. Not too late. It's not too late at all. Well, meanwhile, I am looking forward to our readers. I want to hear feedback when you listen to the audio book. I want to hear what you think about it. You can jump on the YouTube page or jump on the um, page where we do, let's do our podcast and talk to me or send a note to me because I'm very, very interested to see what people are going to think. And if you've never tried an audio book, this is where I want you to try simply <laughs> because Kent is a good storyteller. It's a great, you know, it's a great experience. And it, like I said, it's not going to have to invite 16 hours into it and you're going to have a very rewarding experience. So I expect to hear reports back and Ken, I expect to see you in September and we'll talk about your next work. I can't wait. It's a date. It's a date. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. And to our readers, look forward to seeing you next time on Book Reporter Talks to Interview. Remember, you can subscribe on YouTube or listen to us wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks so much, everybody.